14, 14. I invite you to stand as we read from God's word. <clears throat> when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by, way of the, by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from them before the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot, and took his army with him, and took six hundred chosen chariots, and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, encamped at the sea by Pihahiroth in front of Baal, Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to, in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this that we said to you, what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Some of you are familiar with the phrase uh, latchkey kid. Latchkey kid. It refers to the kid, excuse me, not the kid, the key, that a kid would use, the key would usually be around the kid's neck, and he would use this key to get into his empty house after school. Uh, this was fairly common around 30 or 40 years ago um, for a kindergartner or a fifth grader to be left at home for hours at a time while the parents were working. Uh, 
you might, as, you, you're not supposed to do that today. Um, you might be thinking, what if something happens to the child? And I think the thinking was something like this, they'll live. Now the pendulum, I think, has swung in the opposite direction. We live in the age of the helicopter parent, the parent who hovers over their kid like a helicopter all the time. It's no longer, oh, they'll live, they'll figure it out, but now it's, how can they live without me? I need to be here right with them. Now, uh, my purpose here is not to talk about parenting, parenting styles. Uh, instead, let me transition now to ask you, where do you think God fits in this spectrum? Is he on this side of the spectrum where he's basically distant and he allows us to make our own decisions and then he only swoops in when you really need him for those emergencies? Or is he on the other side? Is he constantly hovering over you, managing your every move like a helicopter parent in order to ensure that you are safe? Uh, to frame it another way, what does it mean that God leads me? Does it mean that I'm basically on my own until I realize that I actually need him and then I cry out to him for help and then he will come lead me? Is that when he comes and lead me, leads me when I cry out to him, please help me? Or on the flip side, does it mean that God is watching over me like a shepherd in order that I shall not want. Helicopter parents, you might say, don't compare with our helicopter God. And all I need to do is trust him and I will be safe from harm's way. Because surely our God does lead us. He does lead his people. That is what the Bible says, and it's in the foreground of our passage today. But what does that mean exactly, that the Lord leads us? And how are we called to live in view of his leading? Our passage here is this sort of transition, this transition between the Exodus and to the Red Sea. You know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what happens at the Red Sea, but we might say this is the highlight of the Exodus. I, already, I know I said that the 10th plague was the highlight. Well, it was one of the highlights, but now we're coming to even a greater highlight when, when Israel crosses the Red Sea. And we're, and we're at this kind of transition zone between those two scenes. And, and we see, however, in this transition zone between the 10th plague and the Red Sea, what happens at the Red Sea is Israel being led by the Lord. That's what this passage is about. It shows us in vivid colors what it means that the Lord leads his people. Now, a quick overview of what this passage says, or what this passage is about, is God's words to his prophet. Also, uh, what God's actions. For example, verse 18 says, God led the people. Verse 21 says, the Lord went before them. That's because the Bible is not simply a news report of, you know, something that a reporter might have reported, but scripture, the Bible, is the word of God. It is God's own word. It is breathed out by God, meaning it's from his own mouth. So therefore, the Bible can tell us and it does tell us what God did and what God said. Most of life, however, is not experienced from this heavenly perspective. In other words, at any given moment, we do not know what God is doing. We don't know what God is saying. God is not really on the forefront of our hearts and our minds. And the people of Israel, they're kind of like us in that regard. That is, even though they have Moses, they have God's prophet who, who uh, tells them what God says, nevertheless, they, they, they still don't have God's perspective. For the people of Israel, their perspective 
is still very earthly. It's still very human. They only know what they know, kind of like us. So before we consider the heavenly perspective of what God was doing, God was saying, and, God was, and how God was leading, that's really the main part of this passage. First, we're going to consider these events through the perspective of the average Israelite who wasn't really keyed into what God was up to. So let's review a little bit. The Israelites have just left Egypt. Uh, they were gathered in this, town, in this place called Ramses, and I guess that was the launching off point to wherever. And, and recall, why did they leave it, uh, Egypt? Well, Pharaoh had been resisting Moses. Pharaoh had been resisting the word of Yahweh, which is let my people go over and over again. But when the 10th plague comes around and the firstborn of Egypt are all killed, Pharaoh and the rest of his nation, they're all in agreement. Finally, the people of Israel have got to go. Please go now. So in one day, with no time to pack, all the people of Israel, they're driven out of Egypt. And just like that, their lives are completely changed. They used to be slaves, going back generations. Their father was a slave, their grandfather was a slave, but now they're free. They were, they've been living in Egypt for 400 years, but now Egypt is in the rear view, rear, rear view mirror. It's behind them. Imagine what, what that must have felt like to have witnessed God's mighty works, to be a part of this great multitude who leaves Egypt. Our passage doesn't say this, but I think we can say this. The people of Israel experienced the greatest reversal in history. Their enslaver, who happened to be the most powerful nation in the world, has been brought to its knees. They've been forced to submit by the power of God. And on their way out, the people of Israel, the formerly enslaved, they've all of a sudden become wealthy. Remember in the previous uh, chapters how it says that people of Israel plundered the Egyptians. They asked them for their jewelry and for their fine clothing, and they gave them whatever they asked for. Now, as exhilarating this victory and redemption must have been for them, their journey has really only just begun. Thousands and thousands of men, women, children, and livestock on the move. And their first stop, recorded back in chapter 12, was a place called Sukkoth. But instead of heading straight for Canaan, uh, Egypt is adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea, and then you know Canaan is also adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea, and so the, qu the quickest way to Canaan is to follow the Mediterranean Sea up, up the coast. Instead of heading that way, because after all, that was the land that God had promised uh, their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the land I'm going to give to you and your people. Verse 18 here says that they went around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. They went in the opposite direction. They didn't take the direct road. They went in the opposite way. Uh, more specifically, verse 12 says they moved and encamped at a second lo location, Etham, on the edge of the wilderness. Now, these places don't exist anymore, so we don't know exactly where they are on a map. But this much is clear. It says they were on the edge of the wilderness. They haven't yet entered the wilderness. They haven't fully left Egypt yet. They're, they're sort of traveling along the border of Egypt, not going in the right direction, but in a different direction along the border of the wilderness. And this pattern continues when they move to a third stop. And this time the Lord tells Moses to tell the people to turn back. All right? They're not making progress. It means they're kind of turning backwards. They're doing a U-turn. And they're encamping in front of Pi Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon. They're, they're to turn back from heading out into the wilderness. Instead, they go and set up camp at a different location along the Egyptian border. 
this time in front of the sea. Now, it's not likely that anyone pointed out to Moses, hey, we're going the wrong way. Um, Canaan, Moses, Canaan is in that direction. Why are we going here? Moses, are we lost? Um, it's not likely that anyone pointed that out to Moses, not because um, they didn't know what was going on, but our passage says that Yahweh was tangibly and visibly with them and guiding them. Verse 21 says, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, did not depart from them, from before them, before the people. See, it'd be one thing for the prophet, God's prophet, to say, um, God says we got to go that way. But it's a whole other thing for there to be this miraculous pillar leading the way. By day, a pillar of cloud, and by night, a pillar of fire. And as awesome as this, this pillar was, it wasn't just some kind of thing guiding them. Our passage says Yahweh was in it. He was in the pillar. The cloud and the fire was the presence of God. What comfort this must have been. You know, faith, according to the Bible, according to Hebrews 11, is the assurance of things unseen. Faith is being sure of something that you do not see. Faith is about remembering God's works. It's about keeping in your head what God has done for you. But what about this? God is really making things easy for them. They can see that God is with them. They see the Lord guiding them. With their own two eyes, they see the supernatural power of God in this miraculous pillar. They even have, on top of that, Moses telling them what God says. Verse 2, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hariroth. And just as he's done in the ten plagues, God tells them beforehand, before he even do, does it, he tells them what's going to happen. He says, Pharaoh is going to say of the people of Israel, they're wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Remember that phrase? I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, the people of Israel, they have this pillar with them but they also have Moses telling them what God is about to do. The Egyptians, on the other hand, they don't have any of these advantages. That is, they don't know what Yahweh is up to. Furthermore, they've just been thoroughly defeated. They've been on the wrong side of 10 straight plagues. They're probably still burying their firstborn uh, sons who, who've, been, who've been killed. And yet, their scouts keep reporting that the Israelites haven't left yet. They're still kind of wandering around the edge of the wilderness. Uh, the scouts report that they were first at Sukkoth. Okay, that makes sense. That's on the way out. But instead of launching out toward Canaan, uh, they kind of went down south. And they've been kind of wandering along the edge of the wilderness. And finally, Pharaoh is told they've set up camp right in front of the sea. And it's, a, it's as if something snaps in his brain. Verse 5 says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? They, they changed their minds. They, they regret their decision to tell Israel to go. Now you gotta, you gotta pause for a minute and, and remember, how could, remember how they were so desperate to have Israel leave? Now they've changed their minds like that. 
How could they change their mind so quickly? Especially that it wasn't just one plague that they experienced. They experienced 10 plagues. They experienced God's power against them, judgments, death. And they just kind of changed their minds. Well, just as we read moments ago, God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. God is ultimately in control. He is sovereign, including the thoughts and decisions of, his, of those people who oppose him, he, including those people who are against God's purposes. He still has sovereign lordship over them. But then also we can consider that there is a human or an earthly perspective on why he changed his mind. Because here's the thing, they expected Israel to be long gone. We, we might estimate that it's been a week or a couple of weeks, but Israel se still seems to be kind of hanging around. And so I think they come to an altogether not unreasonable conclusion. Verse three, Pharaoh says, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Perhaps Pharaoh is saying to himself, maybe Yahweh uh, abandoned them. Maybe Yahweh went on a vacation. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe now's my, now's my chance uh, to go after Israel since Yahweh seems to be not with them. And also here's another, here's another thing from a human perspective. Remember, the Israelites are nothing but a a bunch of ragtag ex-slaves. The Israelites are not soldiers. They don't know anything about war. They don't have, they don't have any military equipment. Even though our passage says, says they went out in military formation, they're, they're really a pathetic army. Plus, they're slowed down by women, children, and livestock. In every sense of the world, in, in every sense of the word, the Israelites are weak. They are very weak. The Egyptians, on the other hand, they are the most powerful nation in the world. They have the greatest army. They have the latest military technology. It says that 600 choice chariots. It's saying there are chariots, and then there's their chariots deluxe. They had 600 of those. They have experienced warriors. Plus, they reason, they reason amongst themselves, who's going to do all the hard labor for us? So Pharaoh, he makes ready his chariot and he takes his army with him. He takes his 600 chariots, his 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots with, of Egypt with him. And he pursues the people of Israel all the way to the sea. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army. Now, how do the people of Israel respond? Remember, they've witnessed God's works. They've witnessed the 10 plagues. They are only days removed from the Exodus. They have God's own presence with them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. They have God's prophet telling them what God is up to. Verse 10 says, when Pharaoh drew near, how do you think they responded? the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. Would you say a bit disappointing given the fact that God has provided for them everything that they need? God has been with them. God has given them every assurance that he is with them. A little disappointing, but also it's, it's understandable from a human perspective. After all, chariots are bearing down on them. Do any of you see yourself in the Israelites? I know I do. Like Israel, we've been provided with every assurance, even better assurances than they had. We've had Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of sinners, preach to us. We've heard the word of truth that he was crucified, died, and was buried for our sin. 
We know that he did not remain in the grave, but he rose again victorious over death and sin. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the Father's right hand. He has poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church. By faith we have received salvation. We've received the gift of eternal life. We've been given the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We have the word of God by, by which we can know God's will and his purpose in the world. And if you are in Christ, you've had the waters of baptism wash your sins away, uniting you to Christ. You've taken his body and his blood and even been strengthened by partaking in his feast. Furthermore, you've been joined to the church, even this church, so that you don't journey to the promised land alone. No, we journey together. And so how richly has our God provided for us? But when severe trials come our way, is it not true that we also fear greatly? That we panic? We're, we're full of anxiety? Yes, we do, because we are but human. It's what happens next, however, that matters. Not only did they fear greatly, the, the passage continues, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, that's usually a good thing. When, when you are in, that, in, in, in your moment of fear and anxiety, yes, cry out to the Lord. That's what you're supposed to do. But, however, with the Israelites, it's, uh, it's not exactly a cry. Their cry is not a prayer. It is not a plea for help. It's not, help us, O God. Lord, Bear your mighty arm against these, Isra against these Egyptians. Lord, bring upon them an 11th plague. It's none of that. It's, this is what they say in verse 11. They say, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Well, there's many graves in Egypt. There's, there's these giant pyramids, which are each uh, giant tombstones. It's a joke. It's, a, it's some sarcasm. What have you done in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we might serve the Egyptians. For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. What did, what did the Israelites say in their cry? Are they crying out for help? No, they're complaining. They're accusing. They're misremembering the past. This did not happen. They did not say, leave us alone that we might serve the Egyptians. They reject the great deliverance that they've just experienced. They say, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians. This salvation that we have, ugh. in their hearts, obviously because they don't say it out loud, but in their hearts, they turn away from the Lord. They reject God. Now, if you're familiar with this passage at all, and, and also at the end of our passage, we know that God will save them anyway, even after those terrible words they say. Even after such despicable words, and, and we know that there are worse actions to follow even in this book of Exodus, God still saves them. Now, what's the lesson here? Does that mean it's okay to be faithless? It's okay to, to complain, to accuse, to misremember the past, to reject the great salvation that you have received from God, to turn away from God, since after all, he saves. I don't think that's the lesson. To use an illustration, imagine, this is just an illustration, but I think it helps serve uh, my, my point here. Imagine that you are married to the most faithful, loyal, loving spouse ever. You got that in your mind? But you still get into conflicts because, because after all, uh, you're both human, and, and uh, you know, conflicts are a part of marriage. And every time you get into a conflict, you say 
and you feel and you think the most despicable things. You say things like, I hate you. I wish we never married. I want to get a divorce. But even though you say those things, your spouse still receives you back every time and you're able to reconcile. Does that mean, go right ahead, keep saying those things. It doesn't matter how I respond to conflicts since after all, my spouse forgives me and receives me back every time. I'll just keep saying those things. No, because it, for one, if you've really received such grace, such patient love, you're going to be changed by it. Because such grace, such love, such forgiveness changes us. Of course, the forgiveness and grace that we receive from God is divine and not merely human. So it's even greater. But there's a second reason it's not okay for us to keep saying these things to keep saying such nasty things and to, and to keep responding to conflicts in this way, something's going to happen to you, which is that you're really going to believe it. You're, you will, if you repeat it enough, hate your loving spouse. You will regret marrying your spouse. You will get a divorce against, uh, against this faithful person. What I'm saying is, it's not okay to follow this example. Of course, the harsh reality is that the Israelites, uh, they are us. This passage holds up a mirror, and if any of us are thinking honestly, that is us. Because have any of you been through trials, troubles, sorrows, these are opportunities for faith. That is, opportunities for us to take hold of Jesus, take hold of all his promises. But sadly, let's be honest, when we've gone through many times, we've gone through trials and sorrows and hardships, and instead of taking that opportunity to take hold of Jesus, what instead happens? Our lack of faith was clearly displayed right? Regrettable examples of our utter weakness, just like the Israelites. How many trials and hardships have you gone through in which you quickly turned away from God, turned away from your Savior, and like the Israelites, you shook your fist at him? As much as trials often show us what we're made of, which is not much, God is not surprised. He's not surprised when we fall flat on our face. Psalm 103, 14 says, he knows our frame, meaning he knows our weakness. He knows that we're prone to wander. He knows how little our faith is. God knows his people. That's why back in uh, verse 17, the beginning of our passage, God doesn't take them the direct way to Canaan. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. He knew, God knew that as soon as the Israelites faced any hardship, any difficulty, they would not, you know, go to God and say, please help us. They would turn back around and go marching straight back to Pharaoh. Please take us back, Pharaoh. We want to serve you. And after all, that's what they say when, they, when they're faced with this trial. It would have been better for us to have stayed in Egypt and served Pharaoh. That's why Yahweh takes them on a different path. Notice what God's purpose is. His purpose is not to keep Israel safe, out of harm's way, in complete comfort. He is not a helicopter parent, in fact. Because... To be pinned against the sea while a fleet of chariots are rushing down on top of you is not uh, safe. It's not comfortable. It's not out of harm's way. It's directly in harm's way. Rather, God's purpose is to keep and protect his people, not physically, but spiritually. That's his purpose. Because the worst thing for us is not danger, 
The worst thing for us is not discomfort or distress. The worst thing for God's people is to return to Egypt. That would be the worst thing for us. And we're so quick to want to do that. We want to come back under Pharaoh's domination. There's a part of us that wants to be re-enslaved under sin's dominion. We're so weak that we quickly, if left to ourselves, we will fall away from grace. And so, in order to spiritually protect his people, the Lord God, he leads them not away from danger, but into the worst danger, humanly speaking. He uses them as bait to lure Pharaoh and his army out. And with Egyptian chariots charging furiously toward them, the people don't have, an op they don't have the option to go begging to Pharaoh, please take us back. You can't do that when chariots are rushing at you. See, in the other scenario, when they faced resistance from the Philistines, they could have marched back to Pharaoh and said, please take us back. But here, you can't march back to Pharaoh when he's trying to kill you. They didn't know it at the time, but this is the mercy of God when he takes that option off the table for his redeemed people. Of course, God's purposes do not end with leading his people into the valley of the shadow of death. He explains his purpose to Moses. He, he already told him, I'm going, to, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue the Israelites why? So I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That was his purpose in the Exodus. That's his purpose here. That was, that's his purpose in the cross. When it appeared that Jesus was defeated, no. In fact, this moment of defeat turned out to be a prelude to his greatest victory. And that is also God's purpose in our trials. That God says, I'm going to use your trials to get glory for myself. I'm going to use your trials so that you and people around you will know that I am the Lord. Has it ever occurred to you that God would use you for his glory? You, the clay, God, would, God the potter would use you, the clay, for his own glory? This is the reason why we exist. Man's chief end is to glorify God. And how does God get glory in the Exodus? How does God get glory at the Red Sea or in the cross? How does God get glory when you're in the valley of the shadow of death? When you're suffering severe trials, God gets glory when he bears his powerful arm and he saves. Verse 13, and Moses said to his people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. What does it mean that God leads us? Well, here's the answer. Sometimes it means that God will lead you right into the valley, into the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes he will take you right up to the sea with an army of chariots breathing down your neck. Why does he do that? So you will learn to trust him. So you will learn to stand firm in him. So you will turn to your only hope, your only refuge, our rock and our redeemer. He does that so you will come to know that he is Yahweh. He is the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we don't 
fully understand your purposes, Lord, our perspective is only human. And yet, Lord, we see how you would use your people to gain glory for yourself, that you would be glorified in us. And so, Lord, you do bring trials to us, Lord, so that we might learn to trust in you, that you would save us, and that you would reveal, Lord, your, your might and your power and your wisdom and your grace. Help us, Lord, to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all rise in response.